The 2010 economic crisis rocked the European project to its core, testing the resilience of its institutions to their limits. The crisis challenged the EU institutions' capacity to absorb disturbance and reorganize while undergoing change so as to still retain essentially the same function, structure, identity and responsiveness. There is a rush, in my opinion, behind these many new decisions of economic governance which have been taken in the last five years, more than in the previous 20 years. The ratio is the kind of trade-off between, on the one hand, solidarity, on the other hand, control. In practice, the states, in particular the weak states of Southern Europe, get solidarity in exchange of enhanced central control of their budgetary policies. The flurry of initiatives born from the crisis were rooted in a compromise which see credit to nations in the EU, such as Germany or the Netherlands, support debit to nations such as Greece or Portugal in exchange for enhanced fiscal and budgetary control exercised through the EU institutions. These new trade-offs have changed the underlying dynamics of European integration. EU institutions, um, uh, after the crisis, they are more uh, incentivized uh, to uh, generate more market correcting integration, like positive integration, like involving uh, central handling of the instruments. The 2010 Eurozone crisis forced European leaders to set up a series of new instruments focused on fiscal and budgetary control. These controversial policy choices favoring austerity, reflected the dominant concerns during the fast-burning phase of the crisis, characterized by market panic and an immediate threat to the survival of the euro. I think you would have to say the fast-burning years actually start in August of 2007, and the first European institutions that are affected are related to monetary policymaking and financial regulation, and the impact was dramatic as the European Central Bank and other corresponding institutions tried to manage this crisis. We learned a lot about the need for coordination, particularly in the period in 2008 after the Lehman Brothers crisis deepened or intensified the extent of financial panic. Lehman Brothers suffering a spectacular downfall. And as they began to learn this need for coordination, what we discovered was that the coordinating ability of the European institutions was less effective than we might have imagined, and a lot of popular satisfaction with European institutions diminished as a consequence. Eventually, market panics and risks of contagion receded, most notably after the European Central Bank declared in July 2012. The ECB is ready to do whatever it takes to preserve the euro. European leaders have since been confronted with the slower burning phase of the crisis as they seek, despite their disagreements, to address the structural faults of the economic and monetary union. In the fast burn, they govern by the rules and the rule by the numbers. In the slow burn, they say, oh my God, this isn't working. Let us reinterpret the rules, but we have to do it by stealth. And when we're in the slow burn, then the technical actors have an opportunity to change things. In the slow burning part, what we see now is a, a struggle around the government that uh, instruments in, in the Eurozone with Germany pushing very hard to ch change the regulatory uh, regime around government bonds uh, and to push banks also to uh, cap their holdings of government debt. And you see reactions from Italy, for example, that say, well, this is a a solution that would only work for for uh, Germany, but it would create it would create uh, grave problems for other sovereigns. So we we are continuing with a situation of, of crisis uh, that require that would require responses that are simply not politically feasible at the, at the moment. As the EU moved from the fast burning to the slow burning phase of the crisis, the policy focus shifted from fiscal and budgetary control to government debt management. This proved to be a major source of political disagreement, which has since proven to be the major break on new governance initiatives. The crisis is more a crisis of the institutions instead of uh, the uh, challenges as such. <laughs>
objectively the EU has become or has created uh, um, straitjackets uh, in terms of uh, what kind of policies, especially taxing and spending policies, uh, were um, viable at the national level. So there was a, you know, an objective side and also a political side uh, on the side on, on behalf of uh, national leaders. Uh, but that, that has been the second side has been rather myopic in my view. From the political point of view, from the democratic point of view, I think uh, the reforms uh, provoked by the crisis uh, were not uh, first-class reforms. Uh, so democratic accountability, democratic control, the feeling on the citizens that the decisions to adjust or to uh, ask for reforms uh, were adopted under democratic uh, uh, procedures was not uh, successful. This obvious democratic deficit contributed towards undermining the perceived resilience of the EU as the legitimacy of its crisis response is challenged. Legitimacy is here understood as securing the consent of the governed through political participation as well as policy processes and outcomes. The uh, major EU actors thought all we have to do is double down on the rules governed by the rules, ruled by the numbers, and we'll get good output. And it doesn't matter if there's no citizen input. Well, no, that doesn't work that way. There are three kinds of legitimacy. One is input legitimacy, which is citizen participation. The next is output legitimacy, which is um, policy performance and effectiveness. And the third is throughput, which is uh, the quality of the processes. Input and output, uh, there are trade-offs. If you have good policy performance output, then even if there's no citizen input, that's fine, there's a trade-off, it's still seen as legitimate. And on the other side, if there is strong input, uh, participation by the people, that they vote for a really stupid policy, and it doesn't work, it's still legitimate because they voted for it. Considering the in, out and throughput dimensions of legitimacy, efforts to secure the consent of the governed can be thought of in three ways. Yet each of these options has raised a specific paradox at the European level. Each stage of the crisis, new steps, more daring, were taken. And uh, interestingly enough, and this is where the problem starts, they are sometimes taken uh, by meetings of finance ministers or the most daring moves have been made by the European Central Bank, by Mr Draghi who is not elected by anybody and who doesn't answer directly to anybody because this is supposed to be an independent and politically neutral institution. So this is a paradox. On the whole, national governments agreed on one point. They were not particularly keen to see the Commission or the European Central Bank play a stronger role. And yet, this is precisely what happened, for lack of a better alternative. Essentially because they did not agree among themselves and because they did not trust uh, each other, it was felt necessary to reinforce the powers of both the Commission and the European Central Bank. The problem with throughput legitimacy is if the processes are accountable, transparent, inclusive and accessible, if they're good, they're invisible. If they're bad, they taint the input, they skew the output. And that's really the problem for the Eurozone. Because uh, the crisis was severe, because the decisions that were taken led to uh, uh, well, severe austerity measures, their social implications were quite negative in some countries and that has undoubtedly uh, weakened uh, the overall legitimacy of uh, Europe. Which, which leads us to a kind of paradox, namely uh, how this stronger Europe can really respond to the growing discontent of uh, the public. The major way in which um, the institutions have reacted to the crisis is essentially to let the technocratic institutions, the non-democratic institutions, the European Commission, the European Central Bank, 
um, some uh, special institutions that were set up outside control of the European Parliament or outside the control of the Council of Ministers deal with the problem. The IMF came in, which is not a European institution, but it's also a technocratic institution. Those have had to do the somewhat dirty work, like, for example, cleaning up uh, the Greek government's debt. And that, together with the economic policies that were um, very much set in the north of the European Union, a policy of austerity, has really undermined the, the, the trust in European institutions and in European policy making and some of the values that the European Union stood for. Throughout the fast-burning phase of the crisis, European policy responses set up would to a certain extent fracture the implicit consent of the government. Eventually, this resulted in changing modes of participation, characterized by increasingly polarized politics and mounting Euroscepticism, which would ultimately feed into decision-making within the European Council. The politics of these kind of you know, conflictual uh, European Council meetings in which not much comes out, reflects directly on the institutions, on um, particularly on uh, the, the European Council as an ultimate decision-making body, that uh, uh, it's, it's projecting an image of, of uh, conflict and uh, compromise and not an image of decisive action and uh, coherence. Having emerged from the fast-burning phase of the crisis as the ultimate decision-making body, the European Council, besides struggling with an image problem, also faces a growing democratic accountability problem, as neither the European nor the national levels can exert full parliamentary control over its collective decisions. The European Parliament does not matter. There is no way of taking the European Parliament back in. <clears throat> the general answer is, or the standard answer is, uh, the European Council is accountable to national parliament. But when they decide, they decide as a unitary institution, where the national parliament are, of course, 28 national parliament. They are separated. National parliaments have actually been um, a bit marginalized in that sense. And um, they've certainly tried to keep up and uh, made efforts to uh, keep being informed. Um, but they've certainly not been at the very center of decision making. If you see the national parliament power, you see that the Bundestag is certainly powerful in controlling the chancellor in their own behavior, but that is not the case for the Greek parliament. So when you say national parliament, there are national parliament that matter, uh, like the German one, and national parliament that are, do not matter, even they are humiliated, like the Greek uh, parliament was. So here we have, we have entered a, what I call a legitimacy vacuum. On the other hand, what I observe, and I think that's the new thing, is that parliaments are now much more active in uh, communicating and debating um, these European policies. And I think this could really be their great role. It could be their added value, so to speak, um, that probably they're not the main uh, decision makers, but at least they become the primary arenas for uh, public debate and discussion about policies. Over time, and in the absence of a fundamental treaty change, European actors have responded to the input paradox born from the fast-burning phase of the crisis by encouraging ever greater involvement of the elected members of the national parliaments. If these changes have widened the circle of elected officials involved in European governance, they leave unsatisfactory mechanisms of democratic control unchanged. Unelected officials, empowered by the crisis, remain beyond the reach of direct democratic control. The crisis has uh, changed the balance uh, between the European institutions. The European Central Bank is uh, tremendously strengthened. Because its actions, uh, which were you know, you know, innovative and sort of violating the uh, treaty, as the Germans complained, uh, the only thing that uh, stopped the vicious circle of the sovereign debt crisis. And what you saw with the Commission, again, is a recognition we have got to change the rules in order to have better performance. It doesn't have the same flexibility that the European Central Bank does, or some autonomy, rather, because it has to worry about the Council, and in particular Germany and its allies. The 
Commission was in a difficult position because on the one hand it wanted to play a more intense role in the uh, uh, aftermath of the crisis but at the same time it was um, kind of hamstrung or, or prevented from doing so by, um, by national governments and particularly by uh, the German. Distrust born from the fast-burning crisis prompted the European Council to seize the political initiative as it manages the balance between creditor and debitor nations. Over time, the Council increasingly acted as a deliberative political body, discussing possible policy changes. The European Council, in fact, became more of a deliberative political body as Germany and others agreed first to growth in 2012, then to flexibility in 2014, and also a discourse of investment by 2015. From 2012 onwards, as the EU settled into the slow-burning phase of the crisis, changes in procedures and discourse resulted in relatively more malleable European government's instruments. As a result, fiscal and budgetary controversies have increasingly become part of the European policy processes. However, in the absence of a dedicated Euro budget, the empowered supranational institutions have remained marginal with regards to counter-cyclical policies. For instance, the impact of the European Youth Guarantee is much smaller than that of national social security and unemployment benefit systems, despite the decisive actions taken by supranational institutions such as the European Central Bank. Overall European policy outcomes remain piecemeal. Well, what the ECB was able to do was restore market confidence, but that doesn't mean that it restored market function, at least not entirely. Unfortunately, the ECB remains the only decisive European institution is the only one that can, can react at the same pace and timing of financial markets, as a consequence of which the ECB has had to pursue an ever more aggressive, unconventional monetary policy. Just basically, what we're learning, not just from the ECB, but all across the board, is that under near zero interest rate conditions, it's very difficult for central banks to do anything more. Stimulus would be the ideal thing. Banking union could help. In 2015, the need for further fiscal stimulus and the opportunity of a fully formed banking union were laid out in the so-called Five Presidents Report. It sets out how, by 2025, the EU would seek to strengthen the in- and output legitimacies of those policies associated with the euro. The report calls for an immediate financial union, a prospective fiscal union and a possible common budget for a political union. The first of these three unions European policymakers have sought to tackle is the financial one. There was no system set up for um, essentially bailing out banks or failing then later governments that failed at the federal level, that is at the EU level. This was meant to be a national obligation, which in an integrated market where some countries think of the Irish system, where the banks were bigger than the, quite a lot bigger, five times bigger than the government budget of, the, of Ireland, is, is just was not working, was not workable. I mean, it was all legally because it was in the treaty. Nobody had um, really paid attention to the fact that there would be no federal bailout. And then when the crisis hit, governments were forced to deal with the particular problems within their countries. But the, the problems were European-wide problems, but there were national solutions asked for. If the construction of a more comprehensive financial and banking union is a universally recognized necessity, several controversies remain regarding the pillars that would necessarily underpin it. The first one was a single uh, supervisory mechanism. Let's put it this way, now it is in place. The second pillar was a single resolution mechanism. Basically, when a bank has a problem, how do you resolve that problem so that taxpayers don't have to bail out that bank? And in that second pillar, I don't think that uh, uh, we'll be able to reach that objective, uh, first of all, because in the single resolution board, uh, the fund that will be in there will be about 55 billion euros in 20, 
2023, this is way too small. In addition, regarding the second pillar, uh, the principle of it is you have what we call bail-in, which means that if a bank has a problem, before tapping into the fund, uh, then creditors have to take their share of losses. Uh, when you look at the technical details, uh, our conviction at Finance Watch is that the uh, single resolution mechanism will not work. The third pillar of the banking union was the single deposit guarantee mechanism. And in that respect, despite the five presidents' report uh, of last summer, uh, we won't go where we need to go, uh, just because one of the member states, uh, Germany, uh, is strongly opposed to any kind of uh, single deposit guarantee mechanism. Beyond the immediate need for a more perfect financial and banking union, to mitigate the risks associated with European-scale financial institutions, a sustainable common currency also requires some form of fiscal union. This has proven an even more controversial prospect. The Eurozone as a monetary union cannot survive in the long run without some fiscal union. That is a greater pooling of fiscal resources at the European level. Not that we need a kind of common fiscal union per se, but we do need some certain common fiscal instruments. I don't think we have. I think a euro bond would be one thing, which I hope at some point the Europeans, especially Northern Europeans, will be ready for. For me, the, in terms of economic policy and the economics of, of the European crisis require, and of the slow burning and also the fast burning, would require uh, formal mechanisms for coordination and uh, supranational fiscal authority. And it's very difficult to see who in Europe has the willingness to, to take uh, fiscal policy at the European level. The creation of a continent-wide fiscal union is a massive enterprise with few historic precedents. One of the few points of comparison is the creation of the United States federal tax and monetary system. Following independence, the crushing debt the 13 American colonies were left with pushed them towards implementing a federal tax thus shifting a share of the burden from the state to the federal level. This allowed for state taxes to decrease as new federal resources were mobilized. This historic precedent, the principle that new streams of revenue at different levels can shift existing tax burdens rather than necessarily increasing them. It was 200 years ago and, and many things changed, but the, this, 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 this principle di didn't change. By giving some kind of power to tax, some kind of fiscal uh, tools to the, to the European Commission or European institution, European Parliament, this paradoxically can, can bring some kind of, maybe not tax relief for average European, but for sure it doesn't have to bring more taxes that average people will pay. Counterintuitively, new fiscal provisions at the European level could result in a reduced fiscal burden at the individual one. Such out-of-the-box thinking is needed, considering orthodox fiscal recipes have shown their limits. However, new thinking in fiscal affairs needs to be echoed with proactive budgetary initiatives. And as long as there's a problem in, of demand in the Eurozone and that you're not creating credit because, you know, why would businesses invest if there's no future growth potential? The way to create that, I think, especially at very long Term, very low long-term interest rates, is to invest in public infrastructure. There is no political will to do it. So from that point of view, I think the, the instruments, that the, the policy instruments that were set in place were too narrowly focused on fiscal policy and on structural reform. Again, a euphemism for make it easier to fire and hire people. And that there's been a kind of lack of focus on investment on growth, which has slowly kind of crept in the European semester, but you know, as we see in the actual implementation. Um, it's, it's very hard to see any real evidence of this. The challenge of continued low growth has raised the spectre of deflation and stressed the need for new catalysts of economic activity. On the one hand, in 2013, the European Central Bank, under Mario Draghi, launched its quantitative easing policy. It sought to increase liquidity in the financial sector to make it easier for private financial institutions to pump money into the real economy. On the other hand, in 2014, the European Commission under Jean-Claude Juncker launched a public investment initiative. By way of complex financial measures, the so-called Juncker Plan takes a relatively small public investment 
of 21 billion euros and leverages it some 15 times. European leaders agreed to both the ECB's quantitative easing policies and the Juncker plan because by then low growth and a lack of investment had become shared concerns. The unorthodox nature of these monetary policies and public investment instruments reflects the legal and political constraints the European institutions work under. However, the easy money provided by the ECB and the Juncker Plan's complex investment mechanisms seem but a drop in the ocean for those favouring more policies directly stimulating demand. Transfers, say, if you could helicopter money if the money is used to actually give money to people, but, uh, or a, a credible commitment to a uh, higher long-run inflation target, but that's, also, that's politically out of bounds. So I don't quite know what they can do. If I were, if I were I'm very glad I'm not Mario Draghi, because he's a very smart guy with, who knows the problem, but has, doesn't really have the tools. The Juncker plan is, is re rearranging the deck chairs on, you know, on, on the, the sinking ship. Much of the pessimism surrounding EU governance in hard times reflects the fact that European actors have reached the limits of what the treaties allow them to do. For the foreseeable future, any absence of a political consensus in favour of a European budget and or Treasury blocks the prospect of a full-fledged European economic government. The crisis created uh, a loss of trust of citizens in the capacity of national institutions and European institutions to uh, manage that challenge to uh, find uh, a way out of that crisis. I'm still an optimist. I still think that the foundations of European integration are sound enough that there will be more crises, but that let's say 15 years from now, we will still have a euro. In 2010, as the crisis threatened the survival of the common currency, the European Council emerged as the ultimate decision-making body and rapidly took the gamble of the resilience of European governance, a wager carried by several experts, key member states and the bulk of the European institutions. By 2012, the institutions of both the EU and the Eurozone, as laid out in the Lisbon Treaty, had weathered the fast-burning crisis without any structural changes. Within our mandate, within our mandate, the ECB is ready to do whatever it takes to preserve the euro. And believe me, it will be enough. In the midst of the crisis, we build up uh, crisis funds supporting countries. We build mechanisms to deal with our budgetary problems. Uh, have done, uh, worked on a lot of results there. And finally, the last year, we've done a lot of work on the banking union. As you know, the banking union basically means same rules, same regulations, European supervision on our banks. We are ready to, to make any reform, but only in line with the primary law. And as soon as we get amendments to the primary law, that is the Lisbon Treaty, we can do more. As long as we are bound to stick to the given primary law, we have to, we have to make some uh, more dynamic in integration in, in a pragmatic, intergovernmental way. People question the EU also because decisions of EU have become more important because people link the EU with austerity policies um, in many countries and this creates resistance. The overriding budgetary concerns underpinning the response to the fast-burning phase of the Eurozone crisis exacerbated the legitimacy vacuum facing the Council's collective decisions the marginalization of supranational institutions and growing popular discontent. The fast-burning phase of the crisis imposed policy innovations that would once more throw into question the balance to be struck between the central imperative of the monetary union and the diversity of national political economies. There has been a lot of policy innovation. Uh, 
um, in terms of how the policies are delivered, but also what is the content of uh, the new economic and social policies. For sure, there is um, a large, still fairly large room for maneuver for national governments to decide on their own strategy. Um, and uh, obviously what we can see is that the member states who uh, have traditionally strong welfare states are in a much, much better place. And so the impact on the healthcare system, for example, has been dramatic in countries like Greece or Bulgaria or even Spain, whereas um, the pace of change has been much, much slower and incremental in countries like France. But at the same time, it is also a matter of um, politics and uh, policy decisions. Um, so it, the very difficult thing to determine is the impact of EU rules and EU institutions because it's very much mediated by national contexts and national politics. Most of us would say that more and better coordination is the key, uh, but for that the European institutions need to function differently and need to function better. Half a decade after the start of the Eurozone crisis, European leaders and institutions still trust in the EU's resilience. However, considering the accepted need for more coordination, voices continue to doubt the soundness of the Economic and Monetary Union, arguing in favour of radical change. The most sceptic call for a step backwards, dismantling a supposedly dangerous common currency. The difficulty with the crisis uh, is that it has shown the construction of the euro area uh, as the worst possible form of confederation where individual member states uh, uh, were denied the tools uh, they needed to solve uh, uh, basic economic uh, problems and the common currency was exploited by some member uh, states to defend uh, interests uh, by their constituents and their special interests in their countries at the cost of other member states. There is no institution that has the authority and the responsibility to take decisions that can diffuse uh, a, uh, a common crisis for the common good. I don't really see any proposals uh, that, uh, that are feasible in a political sense because the way the European Union Treaty uh, has been structured, uh, every member state can veto uh, any uh, of the good proposals that would solve the problem. We should move back backwards. Uh, I think, uh, I think we, should, we should find ways to, to get away from the straitjacket that, uh, that the euro has, uh, has created in order to salvage democratic legitimacy and salvage the European Union project. Those supporting more proactive European policies call for a jump forward in European integration. You cannot have representation without taxation. The, Parliament, the European Parliament should have fiscal resources, so those fiscal resources can be used for anti-cyclical uh, purposes. By giving the instruments to the European Union institutions to uh, balance uh, the surplus of one country and the losses of the other countries. I know that this is highly controversial, but in the federal system, and the European Union is a federal system, you can't escape from that necessity. There is also a lack of willingness of European leaders uh, to, to lead um, uh, to, a, uh, to a clear uh, perspective. I mean, there's either um, the, 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 the willingness to, 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 to unite, there's, there's one, one idea is to have to develop uh, European political unity. Uh, on the other side, many of the states, like uh, Britain, for instance, uh, never have, have accepted um, uh, that goal. But if we agree that as soon as possible we would move such an uh, enhanced cooperation, pragmatic intergovernmental cooperation, whatever, in, in common European law, as, as soon as we get amendments to the treaty, it's better, then it's okay and we will work in this direction. I think it's pragmatic uh, to, to move in the direction to get more efficiency for Europe and in this way to convince the, the, the people in, Europe, in, in the European member states said Europe matters and more, Europe is the right solution for the, for the future. The Eurozone crisis questioned the future of the European project. 
its institutions have nevertheless proven sufficiently resilient to maintain their pre-crisis functions, structures and identity. The new crisis-borne policy instruments not only safeguarded the European project from market pressures, but also preserved the stability and growth agenda that has been part of the Economic and Monetary Union since its inception. However, over time, the changes implemented to ensure the system's resilience challenged the legitimacy of European integration. Meeting the mounting paradoxes facing the Union is no longer merely a question of resilience, but one of necessary transformation. This inevitable transformation in the name of the European project means backsliding in the eyes of some or a leap forward for others. As they consider the deepening of their political union, champions of more federalist options debate those favouring more pragmatic multi-speed models. Regardless of the type of political union preferred, the ultimate goal is to see the EU's input and output legitimacies strengthened. Concretely, the two complementary yet competing political enterprises for the European project after the crisis are the need for future transformations to be democratically endorsed through the ballot box and the need for the treaties to be adapted to allow for institutional reforms needed for a more optimal political union.